EVGA's GTX 1070 SC is priced at $440, making it, sadly, one of the most affordable GTX 1070s presently available, but prices should come down a bit because the low end is still 380 MSRP. We haven't seen that hit market just yet, though, because as many of you have pointed out in comments, the 1080 and 1070 are both very limited availability right now, and that means that they're very expensive in the case of the 1080 800 plus dollars if you can find it at all still though these cards from what we've been told by evga should become available on mass probably in the next month or so july is their expected time range for actual availability of these cards in a greater quantity than they are now the card we're reviewing today is the gtx 1070 sc it is stock clocked 100 megahertz faster than the reference design, which is this one, and that puts EVGA's card at 1784 MHz core, and it's also using the ACX 3.0 cooler, which is the biggest change here, uh, as is often the case with AIB partner cards, because the reference design cooler, although uh, NVIDIA claims premium materials and what have you, is actually pretty poor at cooling the GPU itself, as we've shown. So we're reviewing this thing today. We're gonna to be talking about its value overall, FPS metrics, noise, thermals, overclocking, things like that. As always, link in the description below for the article, which has more charts than we'll be showing here, and will hopefully give you some additional insight. EVGA superclocked cards are their most affordable tier of pre-overclocked GPU, and this one sits about 100 megahertz faster than reference. The GTX 1070 SC takes two expansion slots and is a more normal 4.4 inches height the same as the expansion slot height generally, and makes it smaller than the GTX 1070 Gaming X from MSI that we also tested. ACX 3.0 uses a dual fan design, each with two ball bearings rated for lawn service life. Against ACX 2.0, the ACX 3.0 design uses a marginally thicker fan blade to reduce turbulence of the blade, thereby reducing vibration and rattle within the fan, which should help control some of the noise overall and drop the whirring sound that we've heard in some previous models. We'll test noise levels in a moment though. Like the Twin Frozer and Strix cards, EVGA's ACX 3.0 spins down to zero RPM when under minimal load in terms of processing or thermals, and that means it produces effectively zero noise until the fans spin back up. ACX 3.0 also uses round heat pipes as EVGA has done in the past, but adds a conductive filler between the heat pipe and the heat sink. This helps improve the surface area for heat dissipation and spreading, and is becoming more common as MSI with their Twin Frozer 6 card used square heat pipes when it connects with the cold plate, so that's becoming a bit of a trend. The heat sink on EVGA's SC card is mounted to a base plate that contacts the VRAM and VRM components, like MOSFETs, with thermal pads in between the base plate and those components, and is part of what makes up the ACX 3.0 cooler, and is also what you'll find on the 1080 cards and other cards in the future. As far as visuals, ACX 3.0 gets a slight facelift versus the previous version of ACX, which would be 2.0, and it now has LED backlights, also new. The GTX 1070 SC uses white LED backlights, but the FTW cards will have RGB backlighting controllable through EVGA software. All right, so that's the walkthrough. Now we're gonna do thermal benchmarking first, just to bring everyone up to speed. We represent these numbers in delta T over ambient, and that means we subtract ambient from the measured value. There's a few good reasons for that. I've discussed them before, but very briefly, the ambient temperature of a house environment, even a thermal chamber, fluctuates from second to second, and those can be several degrees in some cases. So we subtract that to normalize the results. And uh, also, when you're looking at the results for your own environment, you'll wanna add back in your own ambient temperature, because it's not gonna be the same as here. So that's why we do that. These are delta T, which means that you'll wanna, for this environment, add in about 20 to 22 Celsius to get kind of our absolute value, but just add in your own ambient temperature for a better idea. The GTX 1070 reference card has a maximum temperature of 53.86 Celsius under full load measured with a 1683 megahertz stock clock. That's about 25% different from the MSI GTX 1070 with twin Frozer 6 cooling landing at 41.77 Celsius when in OC mode at 1797 megahertz. EVGA's GTX 1070 SC with ACX 3.0 cooler is 13.84% different from the FE card and is at 46.89 Celsius, which puts MSI in the lead between the two, 
but it's a much larger card, so you have to keep that into account. So here's a look at our noise data. As you can see, we test a few different ways. First of all, the noise print at the bottom is the footprint of noise in the room before our test. We've got 100% tests where the fans are configured to 100% speed. That is both fans in these cases. We've got 50% tests where the fans both are running at 50% speed. We have idle, which in the case of the EVGA 1070 SC and the MSI 1070 Gaming X means they're running at zero RPM. So that is the noise of the system. That'd be the PSU and the cooler, the CPU cooler in this case. And then we've got the auto test, which shows what you should expect under normal gaming circumstances without a custom fan curve. All right, now we're gonna move on to FPS benchmarking. We only have a few games in this video, but article in the description below if you wanna see the full charts for all the games we tested. GTA 5 shows almost identical performance between the EVGA and MSI GTX 1070 cards with the FE card only marginally behind. At 1080p with very high and ultra settings, the EVGA 1070 SC runs at 121.7 FPS average and 87.3 FPS 1% low, which is identical to what the MSI card is outputting with its only 13 megahertz speed difference. The 0.1% lows are the only location where we see a difference and the MSI card is leading by a bit, about two FPS or so. At 4K, similar results are netted MSI leading by one FPS average, EVGA leading the 1070 FE by about 1.5 FPS. So. Nothing exciting here, but somewhat expected since we're really just comparing the same architecture, GPU, everything with different clock rates. Black Ops 3 at 1080p shows the GTX 1070 from MSI at 175 FPS average and the 1070 SC from EVGA at 171 FPS average, with the MSI card sustaining generally higher 1% and 0.1% low values. Its stable clock rate is some of this, by the way. Uh, that doesn't really mean that there's a noticeable difference at this obscenely high frame rate, but there is a measurable difference. The Founders Edition card sits at 166 FPS, which is a difference of about 2.97%. Moving to 1440p, we see the EVGA GTX 1070 SC and MSI 1070 Gaming X are effectively tied with the MSI version of the card leading by 0.7 FPS. Again, completely imperceptible to the user. The cards are, for all intents and purposes, identical in performance at this setting with this game. And against the reference 1070, there is a slight gain of 4.2% moving to the 1070 SC from EVGA, but that's about all we get. At 4K, the EVGA GTX 1070 performs at 55 FPS average and sustains highly timed 1% and 0.1% lows at 43 and 40.7 FPS respectively. These are superior to the Fury X, which looks fine in its averages, but fails massively in the 0.1% low department as a result of its limited VRAM capacity. That creates noticeable stuttering, and MSI's GTX 1070 Gaming X doesn't have this issue. It runs at 57 FPS average, and that's a gain of 3.57% over the EVGA card. The reference card is at 53.3 FPS average, and they're all pretty close at 4K, mostly because it's such an abusive setting anyway. Shadow of Mordor puts the EVGA GTX 1070 at 121.7 FPS or just one FPS behind the MSI 1070 and about one FPS ahead of the reference 1070. At 1440p, we see a gap marginally widening between the aftermarket cards and that puts them at 86 FPS for EVGA and 89 FPS for MSI or a 3.43% difference. The Founders Edition card again at 1440p is at 77 FPS which is actually noticeably slower than the AIB partner versions. In fact, it's actually 14.46% slower than MSI and 11% slower than EVGA. And this result coincides with our original 1070 FE overclocking results that showed that Mordor is sensitive to the clock rate increases. Mordor at 4K shows the EVGA 1070 SC at 49 FPS with MSI at 51.3 FPS and the FE card at 40.7 FPS or noticeably slower than both. It's actually 18.5% lead for EVGA over the FE card. So that's a pretty noticeable jump, almost 20%, and is a reason why you would want the AIB partner card other than the thermals, the noise, and the price, if you needed more reasons. In terms of DX12, we'll just show Ashes of Singularity here, which serves as one of the new API benchmark games on our test platform. At 1080 high, we see similar tiering as before, MSI's 1070, marginally ahead of the EVGA 1070 SC and that's slightly ahead of the reference card. Between the MSI 1070 and the reference 1070, there's a more noteworthy gap of 8.79%.
the MSI 1070 and EVGA 1070 are separated by only 3.8% between the two of them. 4K high posts similar results. The MSI card runs at 49.84 FPS average in DX12, with EVGA running at 47.75 FPS average. The reference card finally sits at 46.27, so not a huge difference there between the three of them. Overclocking is one of the few differentiators of these AIB partner cards, and EVGA's GTX 1070 SC is effectively a reference design. So it's got the same power phase setup as this Founders Edition card that is a four plus one phase power design for the VRM. And it's also got the same power header here. So it's just one eight pin as opposed to something like this MSI 1070, which has an eight pin and a six pin. So considerably more power there, about 75 watts extra total power budget, whether that's tapped into, of course, depends on a few other things, but that's the theoretical power budget on that one. Now, as we've said before, we use real world applications to validate our overclock. So as opposed to using something like just Furmark, where you generate one very specific type of load and place it on the GPU and don't necessarily see failures until getting into games, we do only games or Fire Strike or something real world. And that means that our overclock numbers are numbers that you should reasonably be able to achieve on your own device with general allowances for the silicon lottery. So let's get into the stepping for the GTX 1070 SC. With EVGA's GTX 1070 SC, we were observing a maximum core clock rate of 1847 megahertz with fluctuations ranging between the 1786 megahertz range and that peak point, pushing V core further and of course doing some OC and gives us room, but not a ton of room. And we ended up with a 2025 megahertz core clock. That's with a 50 megahertz offset from the EVGA pre OC base, which is different from the Founders Edition, which has a obviously plus zero megahertz pre OC. We also had a 4608 megahertz memory clock on EVGA's SC device. And the power target maxes out at 112% on this card with V core maxing out at 1.075 volts. Clearly this is an NVIDIA V BIOS limiter for safety. Let's switch over to our Founders Edition card charts so you can see how this one steps up. On the FE card, and this is from our FE review when it first launched, we were able to hit the very same 4608 MHz memory clock, so that makes sense since they're basically the same hardware but we had a slightly lower 1987 MHz core clock. Not that much lower though. Some of that difference can be chalked up to the silicon lottery, and some of it can be attributed to just superior cooling on the EVGA card, which is helping us stabilize the clock rate as you pit it against time and look at the charts that way. MSI, on the other hand, they go a bit hard. So here's the look at their stepping. The MSI GTX 1070 we've got, that's the Gaming X, is pushing 2075.5 MHz core, and 4799 megahertz memory. That's an extra 50 megahertz or so on the core that we're getting with an additional 200 megahertz memory overclock. MSI is using a custom PCB, it's taller, and it has a 10 plus one phase power design and an extra six pin power header for another 75 watts of power budget. Both of these do contribute to the additional clock rate gain over the EVGA 1070 SC card. Despite using a custom VBIOS though, from what MSI told us anyway, the card is still stuck at a 1.075 volt V core. And that is something we validated. The bit that MSI told us is that they have a custom V BIOS and that it should allow for some extra over voltage, but we're not really seeing that here. So uh, we are seeing the same 1.075 volt max for each of these devices and the 1070 Founders Edition card. As for performance results with overclocking, here's a look at the FPS metrics now. Generally, we're seeing gaps of a few percentage points, 1.8-ish to 3.5% on average, with only a few clock-sensitive tests showing anything more than that. That's pretty expected for this type of OC, though, as the cards are already relatively close to their limit, and you'll only see actual gains in OC clock sensitive applications, and there are a few games that do that, and in some production applications. So is this EVGA card worth it? Well, the 1070 SC falls mostly where the 1070 reference card falls in terms of frame rate metrics. Your main differences are outside of FPS, which makes sense because there's a lot more to these things than FPS. Thermals are critical, often under discussed, and that is one of the places where the SC card does outperform the 1070 FE handily. 
And to that end, with the EVGA 1070 SE, again, we were hitting 46.89 Celsius load delta T versus 53.86 Celsius for the reference design. That's an improvement, and it's at a 100 megahertz additional clock rate boost over what you get stock on the FE card. MSI does outperform EVGA, particularly with overclocking, but the outperformance is really not that much in gaming terms. Now the thermals, MSI does pretty darn well with their thermals, and most of that can be chalked up to this right here. You'll see the 1070 SC is pretty much completely obfuscated. That's because this card's much bigger. It's got bigger fans nearing 100 millimeters and a larger block of aluminum and copper to help cool the thing. So that's where you are seeing most of that performance difference with the thermals. Noise, the noise levels of all these things, well, of, of these two things, I should say, are pretty similar as you've seen in our noise charts. And that really brings us down to two things, which is price and availability. The thing is, as we've said now, the 1080 and 1070 today, as of this video, are pretty hard to get a hold of, especially at their actual reasonable prices. A lot of retailers are gouging right now, as they're doing for the RX 480 pre-orders, and that's not something you want to fall into the trap of, because it's just not worth it. So the range for these cards is supposed to be, I'll lay this down because it keeps falling, uh, the price range is supposed to be 380 to 450 we're not seeing that right now. This card is priced at 440. You can find this particular Gaming X from MSI at 460. And then you can find the Gaming Non X, which has a lower clock rate for, and a, a more similar uh, VRM phase design to this card. You can find that one for 440 as well. Uh, either way, $440, uh, this, this card is good. This card's also good. But uh, I, I wouldn't spend 440 today. I would certainly not buy the Founders Edition card when you've got these two options on the table, literally in this instance. But they're just, it, it's still a little too expensive for my taste. I think as these fall closer to the 400 to 420 mark, that would be where I would be more of a buyer for one of these cards. And that's not to say the extra $20 is unfair or gouging, but it, it just, it feels a little higher than it should be strictly because NVIDIA did advertise that price floor as $380. So I would hang out a little bit, let the stock and the inventory hit the shelves, let it replenish itself. As these retailers are able to get stock and meet the supply and demand without crazy fluctuations that they're seeing right now, you will see these prices stabilize a bit. There'll be rebates, things like that, free games, whatever. Uh, and that will all help with the value proposition. But uh, as a video card, the 1070 SC is good. The ACX 3.0 cooler is substantially improved over this. If you don't want a blower fan, this is a good option. It's got the LEDs if you like those. I don't normally talk about aesthetics, but you can figure that out on your own. Overclocking is okay. It's not anything to get excited about. This has better overclocking. It might be more fun. You're not going to see a performance difference that's really noteworthy but you will see extra clock rate increases that you won't get on this card by nature of the improved VRM phasing and more power and things like that. Uh, so that should pretty much sum it up. If you're trying to spend less, this is the way to go. Hopefully it falls from 440, but otherwise I'd hang out for probably three to six weeks. In that range, you'll see more of these Pascal chips hitting the shelves. And after then the 480 will be launched anyway. So there'll be some pressure to bring these prices down to what they should be based on the initial unveil. So that's all I got for you this time. Overall, that's it. <laughs> no, no real strong positive or negative either way. It just depends on what you're looking for in the price. Patreon link in the post trail video. If you want to help us out, link in the description below for more information. And thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.